experimental design research uh, inquiry into various forests uh, and forest data that involves a collection of speculative uh, material research instruments and performative components uh, that uh, are trying to bring together various forest stakeholders and forest dwellers into a discussion about their forest experiences and their hopes for better forest futures. And uh, through the project, we are basically trying to raise questions about power, about uh, knowledge, about who has the power to produce knowledge about forests, who has the power to produce data, uh, and what does it mean uh, to whom. And of course, we are doing it, uh, we are doing all this, all this sort of provocation uh, in the context of uh, trying to address some issues within uh, climate change, uh, within the climate change context, uh, and somehow support some kind of positive change in the world today. Uh, and with this standpoint, uh, it's quite apt to uh, segue a little bit into another project, uh, which is quite connected to Open Forest, uh, or basically the Open Forest project has sprouted and been partially co-developed within another larger EU-funded project called Creatures, uh, or Creative Practices for Transformational Futures. Uh, which uh, is a Horizon 2020 project uh, that investigates the potential of creative practices in art, design and related cultural sectors to help shift the world towards more socially and ecologically uh, sustainable futures. So the Creatures project, of course, starts from the recognition that in the context of ongoing climate breakdown, we desperately and urgently need some kind of positive change uh, in order to survive and, and thrive uh, in the world. But it also recognizes that the pathways towards these necessary changes, changes of how we live together on the planet, uh, are highly contested and independent, independent, interdependent, sorry. Uh, so they sort of reach beyond the idea of behavioral change interventions and awareness raising campaigns, right? Because we need to change how we live our everyday practices, how we work together, uh, how we relate to each other as human species, but how we also relate to other species that we are sharing the, the planet with. And within this context, art uh, and creative practices have some kind of really interesting potential, right? Because art does something to us. Uh, and many of us recognize that art has this kind of potential to change something. But this potential is very often not widely recognized uh, and is currently quite uh, underused, especially in the context of climate change policies, uh, environmental policies. So the Creatures Project uh, basically ended uh, just last month. Uh, it lasted for the past three years and, uh, and, and we just passed the last EU review uh, uh, basically a week ago. But the project brought together over 60 creative practitioners uh, and a transdisciplinary team of researchers from various areas uh, of social science, uh, design research, uh, humanities, etc. Uh, to collectively investigate how creative practice is and could be contributing to eco-social change uh, and how can we make it more visible to policymakers, funders and various other powerful stakeholders uh, and decision makers. Uh, so this collaboration in Creatures was sort of centered around uh, something that we called a laboratory, a laboratory of 20 experimental artistic productions or XPs. Uh, as a shorthand, um, which are creative projects that hold the ambition to make a positive change in the world. And these XPs uh, that we have been working with emerge from very diverse social, cultural and geographical backgrounds. Uh, they also address the wide, very wide scope of eco-social themes and issues, uh, ranging from, for instance, interspecies pluralism, more than human care, uh, to transformative eco uh, economies uh, and uh, social justice. Uh, and these projects sort of experiment with very diverse engagement formats, including, for instance, immersive installations. We had one installation at the Venice Biennial, for instance, co-creative workshops, uh, performative enactments, live action role plays, board games, uh, picnics, uh, experimental walks, which I'm going to talk about today a little bit more in detail, and various other more or less experimental formats. And so, Working together on and around the XPs in the Creatures team, we observed, documented, and also evaluated the various ways uh, how these creative practices engage their participants with the addressed ecosocial issues. And we have been looking at how these artistic projects can contribute to making some kind of positive change. 
And my role in all this <laughs> was uh, the role of the main curator of this creatures laboratory and also a facilitator of the laboratory. But since we really, the creatures project started from the idea of playing with flattened hierarchies and really working in transdisciplinary manners, uh, bringing together artists, researchers, as well as policymakers to really work together, not just next to each other, but together. So we all had multiple roles and we all uh, wore, so to say, multiple hats. So while I was, for instance, uh, present as the curator of the laboratory, I was also active as a researcher collecting data uh, through participant observations, interviews and other, other, other methods about some of the projects. And I also contributed to a creative projects as creative practitioner uh, together with some uh, collaborators. And so today I'm going to talk about one of these projects that uh, I have been co-authoring uh, within the creatures, within the, within the creatures context uh, together with a few other fantastic collaborators. So here we are going back to the open forest. Uh, open forest is the project that I'm going to talk about, which as I mentioned is experimental design research inquiry into forest data and forest futures, <clears throat> which is developed by the open forest collective. Uh, so we are uh, four individuals of diverse uh, professional, cultural, but also biological origins. Uh, we are namely Andrea Botero uh, sitting there in the middle, just Choi Chui, which is my dog companion, looking at us from above uh, and myself. And uh, we have sort of, we have lived in various parts of the world or all of us, including Australia, Korea, Czech Republic, Finland, uh, uh, and many other places, uh, which are also those places that I mentioned now are the main field sites where our open forest uh, inquiry takes place. Uh, but we have also kind of all grown some kind of strong relationships uh, to the forests around us. And we are all interested in exploring the more than human entanglements in forests, the forest ecosystems and great playful occasions for speculating about forest futures. So this is what brought us together uh, as a collective. And in the, in the countries where we have been living in and where we are from, we have all had these experiences with forests as sites for everyday recreation, for rejuvenation, for play, for sensorial excitement, physical activity, as well as rest. But we have also encountered the diverse local, often extractivist environmental policies and forestry management projects that treat forests as a resource to be used, for instance, for carbon cultivation or timber yields, uh, as a resource to sort of help us solve our climate change problem. Uh, and so the main agenda of this project often revolves around some kind of pretense that forests can be seen as a vegetal solution for climate crisis. Uh, and examples here include, for instance, the mass tree planting campaigns that are promoting the idea that the more trees we plant anywhere in the world, the closer we get to resolving climate crisis. So this idea that we can do more as humans to escape uh, the climate change issue rather than maybe doing less uh, as humans. Uh, and, you know, many of these projects, such as these mass tree planting campaigns, are not very effective as it has been shown, but sometimes they are also downright harmful because they contribute to displacement of communities uh, and they sort of disturb the local ecosystems by just intervening uh, in this very sort of instrumental, instrumental way. And all this might be that they are kind of ignoring or bypassing the fact that forest is simply more than some of trees. It's an entangled complex ecosystem of various human and non-human more than human creatures. So in this context, many forest dwellers and forest custodians as well as activists have been calling for different approaches to forest management uh, and forest policies that would shift from this positivist and generalizing perspectives towards the understanding of, of forests as complex sites for multi-species entanglements and arguing that this is exactly this interaction these entanglements are exactly the thing that makes forests some kind of hopeful place. It's not just really the carbon sink cultivation measured in quantitative measures uh, that makes forests uh, some kind of space for hopeful futures or space for potential positive change. And this is exactly the standpoint or where we are 
where we are uh, sprouting from uh, in the Open Forest project, uh, where we are looking at how various both human and non-human stakeholders make sense of forests, what forests mean to them, and what kind of forest stories they can share. Uh, and we are interested in how these personal accounts uh, can constitute some kind of forest data, because we are really interested in, you know, forest being in this very quantitative sense described as some of data, everything can be measured around the forest, who has the right to produce this data uh, and who has actually the ability to understand this data. Uh, so we are starting from this recognition that there are so many different creatures living in and around forests that might be producing very different data. Uh, and that might be, these data might have different values that, that you know, that might be not recognized uh, in the current forest policies context. So in other words, we are experimenting with how forests and forest data can be approached and understood otherwise. And here we are borrowing the term from uh, the Colombian uh, anthropologist Arthur Escobar, uh, who points to this, who frames the term otherwise, pointing to the relational more than human and diversely situated ways of knowing and being in the world. So through the open forest activities, we are engaging with scientists, artists, citizens, policymakers, uh, as well as trees and moss and dogs uh, who are living in and around forests. We are engaging them, engaging them in discussions around forest futures and the role that forests can play in the climate changed world. And how are we doing this in practice? Uh, we are doing this through a series of various co-creative design and research activities, including, for instance, experimental forest walks, uh, sharing circles, uh, exhibitions, uh, and other situated encounters that uh, are inviting participants to engage with various forests and share their experiences in the form of forest stories. And I will first talk about the forest walks, uh, since they are the sort of central open forest activity and everything in the project revolves around them. Uh, so we are leveraging walking as a research method and a way of becoming responsive to a place in a very playful and embodied and also everyday life like manner. Uh, these walks uh, that we are organizing uh, take place in various forests around the world, for instance, in Czech Republic, in Colombia, in Australia, in Finland. So those places that I mentioned before, where we all have some kind of lift, lift history or we have some kind of relationship to these places. Uh, and uh, they invite local participants to, to, you know, to join, to walk along and explore and observe the forest together with us. And we are using the term walking with forests rather than walking through uh, forests to point towards this relationality to the idea that we are acknowledging the forest and its inhabitants as participants in our inquiry, but also participants in climate change, not just objects uh, that we as humans can walk through or you know, observe or, or somehow uh, make sense of. We are kind of trying to play around the idea that we are not giving them an agency, but that we kind of acknowledge that they have some very active role in where we are going uh, as a society uh, these days. So these walks that we are doing are quite performative and they embrace spontaneity, a surprise and curiosity as driving elements. And in the sense, uh, they are inspired by what we call feral approaches, where feral basically refers to something that has emerged from within infrastructures, but that is unfolding beyond human control. Uh, I think we first stumbled upon this use of the word feral in the Feral Atlas, uh, the publication or project uh, co-authored uh, by Anna Tsing and colleagues. Uh, so in the context of uh, the Open Forest Project, we use the word feral to point to the fact that these walks in the forest sort of unfold beyond our full control uh, as, as human researchers. Uh, so a little bit of a background to the word feral, because I realize that it's not very much used probably in the, in the design research context uh, or the co-creative uh, design research context uh, that much yet. So the inspiration for the feral methods comes from feral species which are those species that uh, have changed from being domesticated uh, to being untamed, so living more or less as wild creatures. These feral creatures are quite interesting 
in that they are very ambiguous and have both positive and negative impacts uh, on their local ecosystems. So on one hand, they are often considered as disruptive, invasive species or predators, displacing local indigenous fauna and flora. You can think, for instance, about feral cats. But on the other hand, these feral species, they can contribute to the enrichment and preservation of the local biodiversity by keeping it sort of in balance. And example here would be, for instance, the feral zebu uh, in India. Uh, so in the open forest, we leverage this feral feralness as a metaphor and a method pointing to the ambiguous alternative more than human and provocative or unexpected elements that drive uh, our co-creative uh, inquiry. So really by embracing this approach uh, and engaging in these feral experiments, we are really trying to figure out how we can make some kind of positive change as humans who are living within more than human ecologies. So we are playing with this idea of letting go of our human-driven control of what we do uh, as design researchers and try to learn and listen to uh, a little bit more uh, to the other creatures around us. So a little bit more about the walking format. Uh, the walks can have multiple, m multiple or varied formats. We have walked both physically, but also remotely using video conferencing uh, and systems such as Zoom. Uh, to enable participants located elsewhere to walk with us remotely. This was originally provoked by the COVID-19 pandemic, of course, because we were not able to meet physically. So we started playing with this idea of how can we walk with a forest together, even when we are apart. So we usually take our laptops with us and just one of us, our bodies serve as the you know, camera pointing, like showing people around where do we walk. Other one has a phone showing details of various trees and plants and mushrooms. Uh, and participants can walk with us uh, in this way. Uh, we are calling it sort of cyber physical walking format. Uh, and we developed it really because of the COVID-19 restrictions. But but then we were inspired and we just kept doing it even, even, even you know, by today. Uh, each walk. Uh, that we have organized is guided by some human or non-human navigator uh, who have a good knowledge or a sense of the local landscape. So, so far we have been guided, for instance, by uh, forest healers uh, in Finland, data scientists in another location uh, in Finland, indigenous uh, forest uh, caretakers uh, in Tabanok, which is ancestral uh, territory of Kamensa people uh, in Colombia, uh, or by activists in Cerro Seco, another location in Colombia, or by Chui, one of the uh, collective members, who also happens to be a dog. Uh, and these walks follow various types of maps with uh, specific points of interest. So some of these walking guides share a narrated trivia about the local forest area, so about its culture, its species, its history, but also its data that they are, that they are familiar with. And these sort of trivias then serve as a key points navigating the direction of the walking group. And then other guides, uh, such as Chewy, for instance, follow their own sensor instinct. So they don't really have any map with points of interest, but they follow uh, their own ways of knowing, uh, knowing the forest. And they invite the walking participants to follow them without any really predefined uh, uh, roadmap. So following this guidance, we walk together, we try to listen, observe, smell, touch, taste the forest surroundings. Uh, sometimes we talk with each other. Sometimes we share our experiences in other ways because spoken language is not the most effective communication uh, tool. Uh, but we are always sort of hoping that through this, we can create a space where we can learn from each other about our diverse forest knowledges and diverse forest experiences. And then at the end of each walk, uh, we share our experiences and reflections and observations in the form of forest stories. Uh, we are doing it either uh, using either a paper and pen or via the feral map, uh, which is an online public portal that we have designed, uh, connecting these more than human stories and data uh, that kind of enable people to attach their stories to specific points in the map. So for instance, you can attach a story to a specific tree uh, that you have you have spotted during the walk, uh, but uh, but the map is kind of open, so you can also add a story outside of any walking location. You can 
probably at a, a story here around some kind of forest area uh, in Mannheim. Uh, the map uh, includes all these forest patches that we have walked around, but also also other other forest patches that I have uh, mentioned, uh, and it also enables to add new points of interest. So you can attach a story to existing tree or existing mushroom, but you can also add a new creature to <laughs> to the map, new forest creature. Uh, so the map is staying deliberately open. Uh, and we are kind of trying to, you know, create an open space for maybe there are some creatures that are invisible, that are invisible to us, that we don't even know that they exist. But some other walkers uh, or participants uh, uh, of, of this project, they know them so they can add them to the map. So there is an option to add various, uh, maybe a little bit abstract creatures such as, you know, okay, animal or a plant, but also a happening, a glitch, an ambience. Uh, and, and creatures like that. So here, going back to the concept of feral, you can see that we are kind of trying to embrace the feral also in the curation of the map. We are trying to leave it deliberately open rather than having the map fully under our control. Of course, there are all kinds of security issues of an online map, so there must be some sort of curation. Uh, but anyway, the general, the general direction is to keep it very open and fluid. Uh, so just a few brief examples uh, right now as an illustration. What kind of stories uh, do we collect in the map? So these stories really come in very diverse formats and diverse shapes. Uh, they have various length uh, and they can contain text as well as images and sounds uh, and also links to various external sites. Some of the stories are very personal accounts of human forest relationships that are expressed in words. Some uh, are documenting local forest traditions and mythologies, uh, and others actually contain numeric data sets capturing, for instance, an exchange of volatile organic compounds between the forest canopy and the atmosphere measured by some sensor. Uh, and all these stories that we are collecting in these very various shapes and formats, they present the type of forest data. So for us, the forest stories in the project are the forest data that we are trying to sort of compiled together as an alternative forest data set that will go beyond the idea of quantitative numbers, numeric measures. Uh, a forest data set that will be reflecting the sort of very situated, experiential, uh, personal data uh, that is shared by very diverse forest uh, entities. Uh, and I will give you now a brief overview of the forest patches uh, where we have walked through so far. I will not talk about all of them because we will need to kind of block the whole day for that, but I have selected a few to give you a glimpse of, to give you the glimpse of the difference of the different forests, basically, uh, that we are working with. So the first one uh, that I would like to mention uh, is the Hiteala Forestry of Field Station located in, uh, in Upayoki in Northern Finland. Uh, where, uh, which is basically a very like highly instrumentalized forest full of sensors and other measuring devices that are in a very long term gathering data about this exchange of gases and volatile organic compounds between the forest canopy and the atmosphere. Uh, it's a research uh, station that brings together uh, tree physiologists, physicists, uh, and various other uh, biologists and other, other scientists. And here we are walking under the guidance of local scientists and data managers. Uh, and we are trying to engage with various open data sets that are provided by the Hitela field, sta uh, field station, uh, showing, for instance, uh, the amount of carbon sequestration per selected tree, uh, et cetera. And we walk through, it's a very, very kind of like defined, very strictly defined forest, very, you would say quantified forest, where you need to walk on the path you can't step outside of the path because you might, you might kill some sensor because you just like step on some kind of technology that you don't expect uh, in the forest. And we bring various participants with us, uh, with us either on the screen or invite them to join us uh, physically. And we are trying to make sense of this maybe slightly unusual forest uh, together. And we are collecting the stories. Uh, so one example here would be, for instance, the story about the carbon tree which is a sort of a local celebrity in this forest. Uh, 
which is really a tree that has a sensor attached to it, which counts how much carbon has the, has the tree uh, been able to sequester. It's connected to an online portal, so you can see it uh, in real time. Uh, so somebody added a story here, sort of speaking almost on behalf of the tree, saying, uh, I'm going just to read the full story. Uh, I'm called a pine, but humans called me the carbon tree. They are obsessed with how I breathe and trade carbon dioxide with the atmosphere. So they dressed me with some sensors to translate my life into numbers. Sometimes I feel like I'm just a living sum of data. So many of them come to look at me and they seem impressed, but I wonder, do they even know that I'm a pine? Do they notice how beautiful my bark is? Do they care about me at all? Or am I really just a tool for them, a resource? So this is one example of a little bit more poetic story that we have collected through one of the walks, reflecting on, on, on this kind of very specific, very specific carbon tree, very specific pine. Very contrasting type of forest uh, where we have uh, walked with uh, is a forest uh, in Colombia or area of uh, forest gardens or so-called chagras in Tabanok, which is the ancestral territory of Kamensa people, today known uh, as Sibundon Valley. Uh, and here we walk together and under the guidance of Kamensa women, which are local uh, indigenous forest guardians who maintain the chagras uh, basically as part of their ev everyday livelihood. So they keep the chagras uh, full of medicinal and edible plants, flowers, vegetables, fruits, uh, and all kinds of trees. And the comments of women also weave uh, their environmental knowledges, but also their struggles, environmental struggles, uh, into a traditional belts uh, called uh, tsombiach. Uh, they are called like that in Kamenza. Uh, and these tsombiach belts uh, have been basically weaved for centuries and centuries uh, through a series of intricate pictograms that hold much of what being Kamenza means. Uh, the one pictogram that you might see uh, there in the corner uh, is uh, depicting uh, a tale of uh, the spectacular bear, which used to be quite prominent inhabitant uh, of the territory uh, and is often featured in Kamensa mythologies, but now is facing extinction uh, due to the ongoing biodiversity loss in the area. So in the way this traditional, and the story of the bear is like really in the center of the, in the center of the belt here. So this is really, the viewing is telling the story of the spectacle, spectacle bear, uh, and is weaved by one of the Kamenza uh, women who was guiding us through the through the chagras. So, if you think about what these belts do, uh, they are quite interesting. That they are actually illustrating data. Uh, they are illustrating data about biodiversity loss, about colonialism, about deforestation, uh, and other connected issues in a very colorful, but also culturally specific, very local and very everyday life manner. Uh, and they're kind of showing us how forest data can look differently. Also really just, you know, in the practical format wise uh, manner. Uh, another location where we have uh, walked so far uh, is the Melbourne Urban Forest uh, in Australia, uh, which is also quite a peculiar forest. Uh, it's a complex ecosystem of more than 70,000 trees uh, that each uh, have their unique ID uh, uh, that are all archived uh, in an open map, which is managed by the Melbourne City Council. So the Melbourne City Council is sort of, has, has, has marked all the trees and put them on an open urban city map uh, and tries to sort of like really get it, you know, make this tree data set uh, available to the public. And we've been really inspired and also provoked by this existing project uh, that was run by the city council, uh, which is this online portal enabling uh, enabling a messaging with the trees. So it enables citizens to send a message to one of the trees that is mapped uh, in the data set. So, you know, you can see messages. I will just read out of them. Dear Mr. or Mrs. Eucalyptus, uh, thank you for cleaning and producing our air. I was wondering what animal spreads your seeds and is it an animal? I would love if you replied. And this is where we really get provoked because the tree of course cannot reply. So we were looking into it a little bit more, you know, in depth and we figured out that there, and like allegedly, I'm not sure if this is just a rumor, 
uh, rumor that there is some human that is actually responding on behalf of the trees to all your messages. So if you send a message to a tree, you will get some kind of reply like, oh yeah, hey, here's the eucalyptus, I'm talking back to you. Yeah, so this is a story about me. Uh, so this was also one of the like first provocative elements uh, for us to design the feral map there. We are trying to leave things a little bit more open uh, and, and open a space for more, more than just one way communication with some kind of more multifaceted uh, interaction. And we are doing it with limited success as I will, I will show uh, later. Uh, but uh, in, the, in the Melbourne urban forest, uh, we have been kind of shifting the walks that we do, not a little bit further, but we have been just experimenting with a slightly different format. Uh, that is inspired by the uh, artistic movement uh, that was very active in the 60s, the Situationist International, who introduced the idea of derives or drifts uh, as some kind of spontaneous movements, unplanned journeys through a landscape in which participants are supposed to drop their everyday relations uh, and let themselves be drawn by the attractions of the terrain uh, and the encounters they find there. So these derives uh, or drifts their drifting in the 60s was very political activity, right? Where the Situationist International were kind of, it was a polit critical political command, it was a political critique. But we have been inspired by this, by this kind of very feral uh, wandering through space and time without any clearly defined goal, which is very much just focused on observing what is happening around you. So uh, inspired by this, uh, we decided to experiment uh, with Derek drifting in the context of our walks as well, uh, in the context of the open forest walk. And we designed a tool called More Than Human Derry, uh, which is an online portal again, that offers a set of prompts for drifting through space and time. So these prompts are very diverse and are, are quite experimental uh, and they kind of serve as the walking guide. So previously we were guided by the common subwomen, we were guided by the scientists and, and uh, forest managers. Uh, and now we are experimenting with basically being guided by this online algorithm or like online tool. And the prompts can be very abstract, for instance, you know, uh, there is a prompt to walk forward, a uh, prompt for you to walk forward and focus on time and space, imagining that every step you take is a year. So if you take 100 steps, you are transported 100 years into the future. And then you are prompted to say, how does it look like? How does the forest, the urban forest in Melbourne look like? How does it feel? How does it smell? Can you touch something? What's going on? So this tool is trying to kind of bring up a little bit more the poetic aspect of of this forest observing and learning about forest and bringing it a little bit into more imaginative space uh, into the future. And then uh, of course, following uh, the, the, these derives, uh, the walkers can leave their story again uh, in the fair map. So here, one example, uh, one example of a story that I found there in the map just yesterday is about Dewey Aura, <laughs> where someone is, uh, Someone is describing a sensation of light, an air that was arising in the sleepy hours in the morning where they were walking through, uh, the, through the city forest, uh, noting that there is a soft, fresh smell that circles the light rays, and the aura is sort of waking up to bring the park around to life. So this story is not necessarily connected to the prompt that I introduced before, but it shows, it's, it, it's included here to show you the sort of spectrum of stories that we might be getting. This one is really describing more of a sensation or a feeling of the human who was walking through the forest. So again, a very different type of forest data, describing some very personal, maybe even intimate moments that someone had uh, with the forest during the walk. Uh, another location, a uh, walking location for us was uh, Reserva in Palmar. Uh, in Chinga, uh, Chingaza National Park uh, in Colombia again, uh, where we organized two walks with students from the Universidad de los Andes. Uh, and we were basically guided uh, by founders of a local ecotourism service who were driving, uh, are drawing our attention to the local Paramo ecosystem and its history, which is very much my, marked by the extractivist industrial development uh, and various bioconservation issues. So we embarked on quite like longer 
journey uh, through the Paramo, uh, through the Paramo rainforest there. And uh, at the end of the walk, the students were invited uh, to engage in the derivate drift. So in the same format that we have developed within the context of the Australian walks. Uh, uh, and they were, they were basically asked to, to drift, uh, drift through the, through the area to sort of reflect on their experiences use some of these prompts uh, offered by the portal, uh, and then they capture their observations again in the form of Esporus stories. And then uh, the last location uh, I'm going to talk about today uh, is, uh, is a forest where me and Chui have been sort of <laughs> taking the lead uh, of the walks. Uh, it's in Bohemia, in Krivoklatsko, which is a protected, a protected landscape area in Central Bohemia and Czech Republic, uh, where the walks are guided uh, by Chui, uh, that basically is followed by us, the rest of the walkers, uh, who are kind of trusting his sense of direction without having any map, uh, waiting where the walk will take us and what the forest can reveal to us. So here the walks are really embracing the idea of feral, of letting go beyond your control. When I walk with Chui uh, in, as part of the project, I really don't know where I end. I have no idea how long am I going to walk because I'm following Chewie. And Chewie, as in a human creature, has slightly different interests in the forest than me. So there are different points of interest that are marking, you know, the walking path. Uh, most of the walks we have, or we started with these walks, just the two of us. Maybe because I wasn't very sure <laughs> what's going to happen and I was maybe shy to invite others to join. But later others started joining us and we started organizing these walks with Chewy as part of festivals. Also other non-human participants started joining us uh, quite often. So this more than human navigation uh, started becoming a little bit more widespread uh, into the public context. And what really stands out for me uh, during these walks uh, is this difference in the sense of time the sense of what what time the forest is working on. What is the forest time? What is the forest space? And what is the forest space time? There have been multiple locations where me following Chewy uh, would get not stuck, but we would just spend maybe one hour looking at the squirrels because they are so interesting, right? They are these weird flying rats or who knows what, and you can't reach them. And for me as a human, I have some idea what the squirrels are, but for Chewy it was different. So we spent a lot of time in the forest exploring things that I would normally not focus on otherwise at all. We have also stumbled upon this otter who was kind of came into the very surprising and very exciting situation. Uh, otters live uh, near the river where I normally don't go because it's very bad, of course. So, you know, I wouldn't feel like it makes any sense for me as a human to walk there. So following this Modern human navigation revealed parts of the forest for me that I have been not aware of at all. It revealed for me new time, a stretch time that I can spend with the forest uh, and observe the forest from a different time perspective. We have also engaged in various new, new uh, feral rituals uh, following Chewy. So, for instance, uh, the guide was kind of, you know, really enjoying rolling in the moss. Uh, something that we call uh, a face moss spa recently. So we followed and we engaged in this ritual and we just plunged our faces into the moss and we waited what happened. And it's really weirdly interesting what happens to you if you stick your face in a moss and you try to breathe through that. Uh, so again, example of some kind of ritual or a practice that we might or might not want to learn uh, from non-human uh, creatures, uh, some other part of kind of forest practice uh, that we might find interest in uh, when we want to learn about forest and get to know forest better. Uh, and then in terms of stories uh, that are left from these walks in the map, it can be, for instance, the story about the Mospa that was left there uh, by Chui. Uh, uh, another way for us to collect uh, the forest stories uh, is, uh, besides the walks, I mean, uh, is the open forest installation, which we have put together and shown at various uh, exhibitions around the world, various exhibitions and festivals and other public facing events. So the installation shows various artifacts documenting the walks, 
uh, such as documentation pictures, uh, drawings, examples of collected stories. And it always also includes a laptop uh, with the feral map where visitors can share their own forest stories. Not really reflecting on a vault, but just share any forest story uh, that they might have. Uh, to make this story sharing a little bit more accessible, we have also created a paper-based version of the map, uh, which we called Open Forest Catalog, which is really just a physical book with colorful papers. Uh, and there are always some scissors and pens uh, and, and glue uh, that you can use to create uh, your story uh, if you prefer it more than the digital format uh, and share it with us. And the last sort of like format that we are using to collect stories uh, are sharing circles, which are organized sometimes after the walks, sometimes as part of these exhibitions, uh, where we sit together and we actually compose these stories together. So we have some kind of discussion. We talk about our forest experiences, what interests us about forests or what provokes us, what bothers us. And then we all uh, produce some kind of forest stories and share it within the circle. And then eventually it ends up in the open forest catalog. And we also try to digitize all these analog stories and put them in the feral map because we really want the feral map to be the main archive of these stories, this data set of various forest experiences and perspectives. So, so far we have collected over 150 forest stories that are coming from these diverse participants, joining the vault, the dairy drift, the sharing circles, visiting the installation that are now living uh, in the feral map. Uh, so about the map. We are kind of playing with the idea of map being a messy, feral data set, which is, which is composed of these very diverse knowledges, experiences, stories uh, that are shared in various formats by both human and non-human forest dwellers and various forest creatures that are having experiences from various forests uh, in different places in the world. And really through this data set, what we are trying to do is we are aiming to obscure the existing, very quantitative, very number, numeric based uh, data sets uh, that exist in the world and that are kind of almost dictating what forests are, defining what forests are uh, in quite limited ways, right? So this kind of data that we are trying to, to stitch in, uh, for instance, data that is weaved into belts or data that is provoked by a dog or produced by a student during their dairy trip uh, in a Chinganza National Park, uh, or data capturing various forest healing rituals, etc. We are trying to include all this to sort of offer an alternative to look at the forest data otherwise. Um, and yeah, the term for feral data actually was originally introduced by Genevieve Bell, uh, who was reflecting on the story how camels were initially imported into Australia for transportation, and then they became feral uh, and kind of wild with the introduction of locomotives who kind of took over their space as a transform, uh, transportation devices. Uh, so Genevieve Bell talks about data and technologies becoming feral, also in the context of technological obsolescence and this continuing replacement of old, old technologies with new technologies, which can of course result in various unintended consequences. So in the sense, we are hoping that the feral map as a feral forest data set can have some of these unintended consequences, hopefully positive ones, uh, that can help us question the existing idea of what constitutes the forest data and who has the right to produce data, hence produce the knowledge about forests and shape forest policies. Uh, and I will slowly turn uh, to wrapping up <laughs> because I, I see the gestures. <laughs> So what does all this mean uh, from the perspective of design research uh, and design research co-creation? Uh, what can feral as an approach bring into the design inquiry? And what does it mean to whom? So first, I would like to just go back to the uh, point of walking with uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, that can be extended to the idea of designing with. So perhaps we can kind of think beyond the idea of designing for, that we are designing as human designers for change but they are actually designing with our ecosystems. And that might be the way how we can support some kind of meaningful change in our ecosystems. By playfully attuning to the rhythms of these ecosystems, 
by trying to better understand the movements of different creatures in space and time, their habits, their needs, their rituals, their desires. And through that, time really emerged as an important factor uh, that we might be, that we might want to focus on. So for instance, this time element that I mentioned uh, that emerged during the walks in Bohemia that are guided by Chewie, where we realized that forest time mean different things to different forest stakeholders, right? Uh, so this designing WIS, uh, we see it as a very humble design inquiry where we as human designers acknowledge uh, that we are just one kind of stakeholders in the forest ecosystems. Uh, and we acknowledge that we simply don't know everything and we might want to learn from others that we share these ecosystems with. So if you think about the idea of uncertainty as a productive design uh, element, productive design research element, here the uncertainty is really given. It's a starting point uh, where we are entering this inquiry with this humbleness and accepting that we are not the masters of, we are not in full control of what we are doing. Uh, as designers, so we are deliberately leaving this control, sharing it with other uh, with other human or non-human participants in the inquiry. And this, of course, requires some sense of trust. So, in the Open Forest Collective, we are a collective of four creatures, and I've shown you several locations where we walk. But it's not that all of us would always walk everywhere, right? It would also be strange if we keep flying everywhere around the world to do this. So, for instance, the Colombian walks are are always facilitated by Andrea. The Australian walks were facilitated by Jess. The Bohemian walks are facilitated by Chewie and by me. So we are kind of trying to also experiment internally in the collective with this element of trust. How do we produce knowledge inside of the collective uh, in this dispersed way? Uh, and trust might be one thing that we might want to focus on again, same as, same as time. And uh, last thing is this point uh, to this multi or transdisciplinary collaboration that we are often uh, talking about also probably at this symposium, what does it mean to do co-creation in a multi or transdisciplinary sense? So through this open forest project, we are kind of pointing uh, towards the direction of not just multidisciplinary, but also multi-species uh, co-creation uh, and where it can take us. Do not keep it super simple and not just end with saying, oh, you know, look all the, at all these great things that we are doing. Of course, through this inquiry, uh, there have been many questions that emerged for us uh, and that we really wish to engage with and also invite you or anybody else who wants to uh, be somehow involved in the project or give a feedback uh, to discuss these questions with us. So the first uh, sort of point of concern is this multi-species, the idea of multi-species knowledge is actually uh, and how much beyond human control can we go as humans who will always necessarily stay within our own human intentions. We can't escape our human intentions as humans. Uh, we always, even if we leave things out of control, we are still defining as design research as the frame for the inquiry that we are doing. And this became kind of <laughs> painfully visible through some of the stories that are left in the map. So for instance, the story of Chui and the, and the MOSPA I wrote this story because Chewie can't type on a laptop and I did it and I thought it's cute and then I realized how incredibly wrong it is obviously because I'm talking on behalf of Chewie who was supposed to be in control of the situation. Same is the story of the carbon tree. Somebody wrote the story motivated by or sort of like provoked by how, how, how maybe sad it is that the tree is just shrank into some of data but it's again written on behalf of the carbon tree, right? So this, quest, uh, this raises the question about the point of perspective that we are using in this more than human design uh, research that is trying to support some kind of sustainable shifts. And how do we reach beyond metaphors, uh, which I think is quite important. Uh, and then of course, there is a question related to the time about privilege. So uh, in simple words, who has the time to do this? Who has the time to walk through a forest seemingly aimlessly and look at squirrels? It's a very privileged activity that we, not everyone can afford, especially in the world where we are living in, in the society, which is a capitalist society where time is money. So observing squirrels might not be the smartest thing to do. So we have very different KPIs uh, as humans, especially as human researchers, than the other stakeholders uh, that we are working with. 
And yeah, the last, uh, the last, last bit, just to bring it back to where I started, to the context of the creature's inquiry of what can actually creative practice do in the world to support some kind of positive, positive change. So here are just a few sort of suggestions of what kind of change we might have achieved uh, or we might be <laughs> walking towards uh, in the Open Forest Project. So first, uh, through the walks, we really offer this opportunity for various stakeholders to come together, reflect together, learn about forest from each other in this very experiential, uh, sensory and situated manner. So the walks are aiming to create a place uh, for playful, convivial encounters and lively discussions about what forest means to whom, hence a space for learning. Uh, another aspect, uh, uh, like kind of type of change, uh, would be the new connections and relationships that sprouted uh, from this open forest engagement. How we have developed new relationships with each other in the collective, with the participants, with the other walkers, but also with the forest uh, that we have walked with. There is also something to say about empowerment, that we might be empowering each other through this practice of giving space for our diverse knowledges to be actually articulated, uh, to be expressed out loud and then to be heard by others. So this, there is something to say about making visible some knowledges that have been largely invisible uh, in the past. Uh, there are also some kind of very like practical terms, you know, for instance, with, uh, the, with the activist groups in Colombia that we have been working with uh, through the open forest practice, we might be also helping to make their own practice visible. So the open forest can also be used as a platform there you can put your project on the feral map and make it visible, use it as another channel to reach different audiences. But that's a very, of course, like practical type of sort of change that we might be contributing to or that we might be doing. But to bring it all together, all these, all these co-creative activities uh, in the open forest that we have been under, uh, performing or like doing together, they might be changing how the participants think and feel about forests. So this goes back to going beyond the idea of behavior change, that we just need to know about a problem, that there is a problem, and there can be some kind of instrumentalized behavioral change, generalized intervention that will say, we all need to start recycling trash. We all need to be moral people and start recycling trash, stop flying, and do all these things to contribute to a better world. This change might need to be deeper. There might need to be a change in how we feel about the world, how we think about the world, not just the information that is coming to us in a very instrumental way by somebody else, usually in a very top-down manner. And the last thing is, of course, all these elements of change that I'm mentioning, there is something to say about the scale. So we are engaging participants in a very small scale, in local context, but the change that we need is large scale is a global change. Uh, but there is something about being happy about small things that we can do. So the small changes that we can do in a forest with five other people might change a little bit, but they change something. And it is still, it is still important. Uh, and again, this little change that we do might be qualitatively different because it might go a little bit more in depth uh, than you know, doing a huge lecture, for instance, and talking about things. Uh, which is what I'm doing now, so I should stop uh, because I only have seven minutes left and I would really like to have some Q&A. So thank you uh, so much for listening uh, and for spending your time with me today and I'm really happy to take any questions. So it is my pleasure helping facilitating um, this Q&A session and thank you very much um, for taking us into the WICS. So we do have speaking about feral technologies. Yeah, many thanks for this really inspiring presentations with great pictures. Actually, I'm also fascinated about your photography skills. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is um, 
yeah, about, let's say, the status of research in the sense that, from my perspective, research is about generating results that are also applicable elsewhere or that basically helps us, let's say, gain local knowledge and then we can, yeah, do something more general or at least apply it in other places again. So I was thinking the whole time, how do you analyze the data or what do you think about analysis? Do you even think this is a good question to ask because you generated a lot of data, but I'm also curious how we can maybe diversify practices of analysis. So I'm very curious about that. And another very practical question, but maybe we can talk about that in the break is, um, um, basically, when you went, when you were walking through the forests, I was seeing a lot of Anna Singh's arts of noticing, and that this is what you were in a way practicing with the people. And I think the idea with the dog is really fabulous to practice other um, arts of noticing. But I don't have a dog. <laughs> I actually would like to do an excur uh, excursion with my students to see the structural changes in the area, um, in the Rhinish area, where we have a. Um, yeah, big structural change going on. And I'm curious how I can actually cultivate with my students the arts of noticing without having an indigenous guide or mm -hmm. a dog. And maybe you have some simple tricks for me, mm -hmm. but yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are both really, especially the first one is a very relevant question. I will quickly start with the second one in terms of how can you follow, uh, how can you, you know be guided by some non-human element if you don't have a dog or et cetera. For instance, at the participatory design conference last year, uh, which happened in Newcastle, we were following the river because, you know, we came there as conference participants and we actually really didn't know uh, the local forest uh, that much. So we were asking locals, you know, what is significant around the forest for them, what is significant around the area. And many people mentioned the river. So we just followed the river. So the river kind of gave us, you know, the direction for where to walk. Uh, and to bring the, because we did this workshop there, a workshop where we brought uh, some conference participants with us. So we walked together and again, try to do this knowledge. Just learn from each other because we as guides at the time, or we, we were trying to play with the idea of the river being the guide. So we are all following and trying to just share what we know. So I would say that there might be different elements to follow in different, you know, forests around the world. Uh, and they might they might not be animate, maybe even. Uh, and then the first question about the knowledge dissemination. So, of course, one part would be, uh, we are publishing papers, of course. Uh, so this is a sharing of knowledge with the, with the scientific community. But then also it's very important to disseminate the knowledge outside, at least for us, outside of the academic community elsewhere. So that would mean organizing events at various festivals or really just doing these walks and inviting the local stakeholders to walk with us. Uh, and then in terms of the data analysis that we are doing, uh, so what we have now are our own uh, experiences that we can self-reflect on. So that's what we are doing. We are maintaining self-reflective diaries. Uh, and we are also, of course, looking at the forest stories that we collect. Uh, and look at the direction that they can point us, look at what kind of feelings are they kind of expressing. So it's usually, it, these are usual texts, right? But we are not doing any, any like quantitative analysis or anything like that. We are really looking into the context uh, of what are these stories trying to tell. And uh, then we are looking at sort of the themes and maybe issues or concerns that are emerging. So for instance, a lot of these stories, as I've shown, uh, are written by a human, I assume, uh, but they are talking on behalf of non-human, which is really interesting. So that brought up one of the kind of key points of concerns of the human intentionality and how can we abandon it and how can we actually genuinely design in the more than human sense and how can we actually as humans try to collaborate or design with, uh, with uh, the other creatures while we are still sort of putting ourselves in charge because we can't escape our own research plans that we have crafted for us. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the analysis, it, it's very, I don't have the right word for that probably, but it, it's, it's, it's very, very qualitative based uh, thing that we are doing. Okay. 
thank you very much for this very interesting uh, insight into your uh, forest research. Um, it reminded me on a, a, a similar project that I did some time ago about how we can use artificial intelligence to analyze ecosystems and forests. And then we came to the conclusion that it's, there's this main problem that we as humans, we create those uh, machines and technologies and artifacts that everybody knows that's here in this room. So we always also inscribe our human centrist perspective in those technologies. And now I was, I was wondering uh, that seeing here your non-human, or that you, you plea for the non-human perspectives to understand the forest, what would you say can we learn from that perspective uh, with regards to technology development? How can we bring the, the dog perspective into the, uh, into the development of an AI, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially especially these days where ChatGPT is booming and everybody is being shocked or fascinated. Uh, it opened so many questions that I'm afraid I don't have clear answers yet, but I was thinking exactly about that uh, a few days ago, about how how we can collaborate with Chewy, uh, you know, to produce, to, to generate new, to generate new text, to generate new images. How can we create prompts? Uh, for AI-based technologies uh, to produce some kind of content. Uh, but in terms of how it goes, for me, it goes somehow, and so far only very vaguely, it connects within the idea of feral. These technologies that are emerging around us are really very feral in the sense of going beyond our control. And we are more and more aware of it. Uh, same as the nature is growing feral and it's immensely going beyond our control because there are terrible catastrophes, uh, natural catastrophes happening here and there pretty much all the time. So there are these two streams that might seem that are not connected, but somehow they actually are. But how do we, how do we bring them together in some kind of, into some kind of communication situation? I'm not quite sure yet. Uh, but clearly as humans, we have very important role in that, for instance, in this connection between nature and of GPT or AI, uh, how do we, we are the kind of connectors, right? Uh, that can build some kind of communication bridge. Uh, but I know that this sounds like it's a very, very abstract answer. And I'm not sure if it is helpful in any way, but, uh, but maybe the answer is that I, I actually don't really know yet, but I'm, I'm also one of those people who is really fascinated uh, right now. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I've been wondering about your uh, aspect with uh, trust and trust as a key, um, because I'm, I'm doing research on trust myself. Um, um, and uh, I've been told to keep it short. So I'm just asking one question. How do you translate the very human concept of trust in such a manner to include non-human actors, such as your dog or mm -hmm. also the forest itself as an actor? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Uh, and of course, all I can do is always make some kind of human driven assumption about the tr trust that we are building together with Chewie. Uh, and these assumptions might be sometimes on the border of romanticizing. So for instance, an example of when I'm following Chewie, it happened, of course, many times that I fall or, you know, that I, I somehow crash myself because I'm going to places where the, jog, where the dog has four legs so he can jump easily, but I can. But after some time where I think like Chewie started understanding that, okay, she's really going to follow me everywhere I go. Let's do this. Uh, last time when I fell, he immediately came and started like licking the blood off my knee because it felt like, you know, yeah, sure. Like, you know, we are in this together, but then how romanticized is that? You know, the idea, that's my human driven idea of, of, okay, there is a trust that we are building together. While at the same time, the dog probably just really wanted to lick the blood because it smelled good. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> there are these discrepancies where it exactly points to this whole escape. How can we escape human intentionalities? We can't. So we are always putting these affects and meanings uh, on uh, more than human, onto more than human contexts that are coming from our human sense of rationality or our human brains. So there is definitely this gap that, that exists. Thank you. I have a question about issues of engagement, um, because you talked a bit on about how difficult representation is in these issues. But I think what you said about 
considering stakeholders and non-human stakeholders as well, kind of reminded me of notorious parliamentary things. I don't know if it translates one by one, but I think it's sort of the, the, the idea of, but I mean, the, the issue of representation to make things and non-human actors speak in a certain way um, is the same, right? So, mm -hmm. um, and I think this is also one of the critiques or, or way in which Latour was critiqued for, you know, you can make things speak or a gifted writer can make everything speak in a certain way. So I think, so how can you avoid making this just a proxy of discussing very human affairs um, in the name of or on behalf of or using like these non-human voices mm -hmm. or sort of almost like a make-believe game um, so what is your in a way or do you have any sort of methodological approach there yeah i think that that, that this is exactly the one of the issues that are so clear uh in the context of the feral map because it allows for human communication so as I said before, the dog can't type, which suddenly becomes a problem. Uh, so there must be different communication tools, different means of communication for how we can actually transfer this knowledge. And usually it goes to this, to this question of, you know, the KPIs or like, what do we collect points for as researchers? Uh, I think that if you want to communicate with a dog, you need more time to engage with the dog and you can't produce a written memo or written note after that, because it will be only your experience. But then the problem is that we often don't have this time. So in terms of bringing this forth of like trying to also like going back to the trust to sort of bridge this gap of what can we actually, how can we as humans understand the more than human world around us better? It might actually require more systemic changes of how we organize our lives. For instance, how we organize our time, because now it's it's hardly valued in academia that you go for 10 hours walk in the forest and you just come back and you say, I have my experiences, they are in me and that's it. Uh, so there is something about larger change that needs to happen, that we can try as hard as we can to do these little gestures, to do these little playful projects. But then it comes to the question of scale. What does it change for whom? Uh, the moment where I need to quickly pick my laptop now and run to go to another meeting and then, you know, uh, travel back to work feels almost like it's contradictory to what I'm trying to, to do here now, what to talk about here. So, yeah. Again, not, a, not an answer that would have any solutions. <laughs> Raising more questions than giving any answers. Yeah, but thank you very much um, again for your talk, Maketa. Thank you and so much. I invite you to give a hand again. Um,